Um, everything was word of mouth. All the shows when we started touring, it was generally, well, I know these people out in wherever, you know, New Hampshire or Colorado or something that they have like a big barn. You guys want to play there? Sure, well, you know, we'll drive out there. First time we, we went to Colorado, there was this guy out there who uh, said he was going to set up a bunch of shows. And so we all piled in the truck and drove to Colorado and we got there. Of course, there was no shows. We had our, our gear and everything. But there was a club in town. This is in Telluride. It's called the Roma. And um, the owner of the club said, well, if you want to you know, play for the door, because in the summer there's nobody there. So we set the gear up. We, were there. we ended up playing like nine nights in a row. The, over the next few records, we were kind of rea every record seemed to be a reaction against the last. And I think that in um, on Billy Breathes, we were we were so tired of trying to make a great record that we just stopped trying. You know, we kind of gave up. <laughs> and in giving up, we ended up with something much better than you know. It's almost like we'd been squeezing the life out of the music because we'd been trying so hard to. The shows are always so high energy, and we always thought, how come the albums aren't reflecting what we do live? And um, then we put out the live album, and I still don't think that the, the live album reflected what was happening at the shows. The only thing, the only thing that you have to watch out for, to me, is that you maintain your course in the face of distractions, which are other people's opinions, caring about people's opinions, number one, and number two, realizing that without knowing it, you're, you're running a, corp a huge corporation. <laughs> um, I always look at Jimi Hendrix's career, you know, and he had four or five really pivotal shows that that always go down as, as you know, you can see him on videos. So if you had like Monterey Pop, you went on at about nine, I think, at night. Woodstock, you went on at seven in the morning. I had that Rainbow Bridge in Hawaii, you went on at noon. And the Isle of Wight, he went on at like three in the morning. And uh, I used to watch videos of, of, of those shows. And I was thought it's such a different vibe, you know? Everybody always plays at, at 7.30 at night. You know, what would it be like to play the first thing in the morning? So we played we played the first day at, at sunset, right? And then we took a long break and then we played that you know midnight or something or 11 and then uh hung out for a few hours then at four in the morning we we went out on this flatbed truck and did this rolling set where we were moving and then uh went back hung out you know caught a couple hours of sleep woke up and then the next set was at i think it was at noon or something the next day which is first thing in the morning for for me, you know, and I, I remember I kind of woke up in this trailer and it slept about four hours, came out, had a cup of coffee, finished a cup of coffee, put it down and walked right back out on stage. It was great. It was such a great feeling because it just seemed like this whole weekend ended up becoming one big thing. Sonny Rollins and, and um, John Coltrane, all, we both have the same story. And the Beatles even, even where, where you know, Coltrane, every, the way the story goes, he was like a hot tenor saxophone player, like all the other hot tenor saxophone players. And then all of a sudden one day he said, I'm not gigging for a year. He went just woodshedded for a year and he came back. He was Coltrane. He completely rewrote the way that that you play music, right? And and then um, Sonny Rollins, his old his story is is uh, that he he stopped gigging and went and played on the Brooklyn Bridge for six hours every night or something for a year. When he came back, he was Sonny Rollins. He, and uh, you know the Beatles stopped touring and disappeared. And every all oh, they're washed up, they're washed up. And they come back, Sgt. Pepper's. They totally rewrote the book on how to make albums. We even think, wondering, since what we do is this group improv kind of thing. And, um, you know, we do exercises and stuff. We're getting, we think, better at it. What would happen if we stopped the incessant touring or slowed down the incessant touring for a little while, locked ourselves in a room, and tried to bring the concept of group improv to in a rock setting to a whole a completely new level? That album was just tell everyone, including our, you know, our manager, the record company, you just, just got to leave us alone. Just we're going in the barn. That's it.
goodbye, you know? And everybody was totally cool about it. And they knew that that's something that we had to do. And we spent that first six weeks without a producer and we were just in there doing all this experimental kind of stuff. So it was, it was an escape in a certain way. And having gone through it, now I now feel completely, completely uh, differently about recording and, and what I want to do with recording, what we want to do. We've already started working on the next album. It was such a good experience doing that last one that on this tour, we've been booking little two, two day, we know when we have a couple days off, we'll go into the studio. The, 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 the dangerous part about it, the, here's the dangerous part about it to me, is that you start, you've only got so much time and energy in your day, and you should be thinking as a musician about playing music, putting on a good show, practicing your guitar, writing music, and as a career starts to build, media and um, business pursuits in terms of the fact that suddenly you're running this big business, right? You've got employees working for you. The danger is that the music will suffer. Um... And it happens with so many people. You know, how many artists have you seen that started off with this incredibly bright future and incredible amounts of potential who, when faced with the onslaught of fame, suddenly became a, a watered-down version of what they originally started to do? And that is a question that I'm always asking myself and probably more than ever in the last year is, am I continuing what I set out to do in the beginning, breaking new ground musically, doing stuff that hasn't been done before, uh, being on the cutting edge. The thing about touring incessantly is that you never really, you're, you're, you, you do get somewhat trapped with your playing songs that you wrote nine years ago and there's no real way to get out of that because even though you write some new stuff, you never really it's tougher to break ground creatively and get into new because you know you're playing to an audience that's there and, and they want to hear that song and you want to play it. there's a lot of little subtle pressures and it's not and it's not that that I don't like playing those songs because I do you know I still love playing a lot of the old songs.